Okay, so uh, my job is to give a sort of historical introduction to the last two lines of my T-shirt. So I thought I'd start off by discussing the context in which the uh, Engler-Braut Higgs mechanism was discovered. Uh, I'll discuss the actual proposal, the original papers. Uh, I'll also discuss another little aspect of the history, which is how it was that it got to be called the Higgs boson. Who is responsible uh, for that? Uh, I'll then discuss how the phenomenological profile was uh, built up in the early years, uh, leading, of course, to the famous uh, Higgs Hunters book. Uh, then I'll discuss a little bit uh, where we are, or at least where we were until very recently. And uh, I would like to uh, argue uh, just to... Uh, Épater le bourgeois, as, it, as you say in French. I'd like to try to convince you at the end that the LHC has already shown that there is physics beyond the Higgs. <coughs> okay, so let's cast our minds back to uh, 1964. Uh, even I was not doing particle physics in 1964. <laughs> So at that time, I think you know, most people would have thought that uh, gauge theories were, were pretty much irrelevant. Uh, it's true that there had been progress towards quantization of gauge theories, unbroken gauge theories, in particular by Feynman, DeWitt, uh, Fadeyev, and Popov. But you know, they required massless gauge bosons, so how could they be realistic? Of course, it's also true that in parallel, uh, Nambu, uh, followed up by Goldstone, had shown how you could break spontaneously global symmetries, but, of course, that also gave you massless bosons. Uh, little parenthesis, it had been shown by Lee and Zemanzik uh, that uh, these theories were renormalizable, that, that breaking a symmetry spontaneously did not change its renormalizability properties. However, as I already mentioned, you were stuck with the situation that apparently you had two different sets of massless bosons. Uh, you had the massless gauge bosons and the massless Gold's bo Goldstone bosons. Question, could two wrongs make a right? Well, Anderson in 1963 uh, pointed out that uh, superconductivity was an example of how those two wrongs could be used to make a right. Uh, of course, that was not a relativistic theory, but he did speculate that uh, what he called the Goldstone and Yang-Mills zero-mass problems could also be made to cancel each other out. Uh, this was also a suggestion which was in a paper by Klein and Ben Lee in uh, early 1964. <coughs> However, it, it was thought to be impossible. And uh, there was a paper by Gilbert which in particular made the argument that you couldn't work this Anderson trick uh, in a relativistic theory because you didn't have a, a vector which you would need for technical reasons in order to make the Anderson mechanism work. Okay, so that was the general historical context uh, back in 1964 when uh, this series of papers appeared. So chronologically, the first one was uh, by Angler and Braut. Interestingly, it's not by Braut and Angler. Uh, then there was a couple of papers by uh, Peter Higgs. And then uh, in the autumn of the same year, there was a paper by Goralnik, Hagen and Kibble. So I'd like to discuss a little bit what is actually in these different papers and uh, how they differ, how they overlap. So I like to talk not about the Higgs mechanism, but the Angler Braut Higgs mechanism, because it was in those papers by Angler and Braut and Higgs. So if you look at the acceptance dates, historically the first paper was indeed the one by Angler and Braut, and the second one was a, a, the first paper by Peter Higgs. In fact, the first paper by Peter Higgs didn't actually point out the mechanism. What he did was to point out that there was a loophole in the argument of Gilbert, suggesting that perhaps, after all, the Anderson trick could be made to work in a relativistic theory. So that paper was accepted extremely quickly by physics letters. Uh, he went away and thought for a week, and he came back with an explicit example of how you could actually work the Angler Braut Higgs trick. And he sent the paper off to physics letters. Mind bogglingly, the second paper, where he actually had the Angler Braut Higgs mechanism, was actually rejected by physics <laughs> letters. 
So I, I know who is the editor who is responsible for that, who is a very good friend of mine, uh, who is now no longer with us. So uh, let's pass over that. <laughs> so what uh, Peter Higgs did was he uh, took a month to revise his paper and then he sent it off to FizzRev Letters uh, where it was accepted. Okay, so, so what was in these uh, various different papers? So uh, we've already seen this uh, picture uh, earlier on today and I think we all of us feel very, very sad that it took so long to find this boson that uh, Robert Brout is uh, no longer with us. I just hope that wherever he is, he's as happy as he looks in this picture. So I, I just chose one illustration from the Angler Brout paper, which people will immediately recognize as the Feynman diagrams that one writes down uh, to uh, represent the uh, Angler Brout Higgs mechanism. But I'll come back to Higgs in a moment. Uh, this is uh, well, actually a bunch of excerpts from the later paper by Guralnik, Hagen and Kibble. Uh, they certainly have uh, everything in there. However, very explicitly in their paper, they re refer to the earlier papers by uh, Angler, Brout and Higgs. Now, I've been told by uh, Guralnik that they came up with the thing independently, but you know, the, the record in the published literature shows that they were, at the time of submission, aware of the papers by Angler, Brout and Higgs. So why do we call it the Higgs boson? I think we call it the Higgs boson because of all these early papers, <coughs> at least in my reading, he is the only one who explicitly pointed out that this mechanism necessitated a massive scalar particle. And it's completely explicit uh, in his paper. Here's equation 2b. Uh, that tells you they've got a massive uh, scalar particle. And uh, he actually finished off his paper by commenting that an essential feature of this type of theory is a prediction of incomplete multiplets of vector and scalar bosons, which translated from theoretical language into experimental language means that you find scalars and bosons that are separated out. So the existence of this massive scalar boson was not commented on by uh, the other authors. Now, I've been told by both Angler and Guralnik that, of course, they were aware of the existence of this massive boson. But the fact remains that they didn't comment on it, right? And this is actually, of course, you know, the key experimental uh, test of this whole uh, angler about uh, higgs mechanism. So if I wanted to somehow summarize a little bit uh, the difference between Higgs and the other people, Nambu and also Angler Brout and uh, GHK basically uh, focused on the fluctuations around the bottom of this Mexican hat. I couldn't succeed in drawing a, a suitably curved arrow here. If somebody can tell me how to trick PowerPoint into doing a curved arrow, I'd be very grateful. Anyway, <laughs> so they were basically discussing degrees of freedom floating around the bottom. Whereas Mr. Higgs, he was, as I said, the one guy who explicitly discussed the uh, quantum degree of freedom corresponding to oscillations out of the bottom of the potential. Okay, so that is Mr. Higgs's uh, claim to more fame than the others. Uh, three years later, uh, his, or their mechanism was incorporated into electrical weak theory by Weinberg and Salam. Uh, and nobody paid any attention. Uh, there is a very nice article by uh, Sidney Coleman in uh, Physics Today, written in the early 1970s, where he does a citation analysis that points out that Weinberg's paper was basically ignored completely, including by Weinberg himself, uh, until Hoft proved that the theory was renormalizable. Uh, if you're interested, there's a very comprehensive and at the time, I might say, also a very influential review uh, by Ben Lee, which appeared in the proceedings of the uh, Batavia uh, Rochester Conference in 1972. And it describes very clearly the various different ideas that went into the development of uh, the whole program. 
And I think that he is a guy who is responsible for it being called a Higgs boson because in his paper he repeatedly refers to Higgs fields, Higgs scalars, and so on. So this is just a, a couple of pages that I uh, copied out of his uh, review. And uh, <laughs> so, so this is why I think the, the name of Higgs boson got sort of imprinted on the uh, collective subconscious. OK, so that was 1972. <coughs> then people, I think, started rather slowly to think about uh, how one would actually look for this thing. And uh, on this slide here, I, I list a few of the uh, early experimental limits on the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, they look a little bit funny nowadays. <laughs> I, 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 Actually, there's one by uh, Sato and Sato from the Cosmic Microwave Background, which I didn't even put on here, which was 100 electron volts. Uh, but you know, if one thinks back to something like 1975, th this is the sort of mass range that uh, people were talking about. So th this was the uh, context in which uh, we wrote our paper on the phenomenological profile of the, uh, of the Higgs boson. Uh, and for, for us, I think, you know, the big issue at the time was, is there a Higgs boson or not? This was the way that you were really going to uh, prove that uh, spontaneously uh, broken gauge theories were right. I, I might say that you know, most other people were focused on different things. Again, you, historically, you have to remember, this was shortly after the discovery of neutral currents, the discovery of charm, the heavy lepton. Uh, <coughs> attention was turning to the discovery of the W and the Z and I think that when our paper came out people thought that we were nuts. Anyway, uh, we made the, the first uh, attempt at a systematic survey of uh, how one might look for a Higgs boson. So th these are some uh, uh, screenshots that I uh, took from, uh, from our paper. So th this is a similar sort of thing to some of the other ones that you've seen about Higgs branching ratios. Uh, the scale is a little bit different because this stops at 100 GV. And uh, of course, back in those days, uh, we didn't know about the bottom quark, so that doesn't appear here. And uh, at that stage, you know, even the discovery of char had not been made official, so we talk here vaguely about new particles rather than, uh, than charm. And uh, over here we have the uh, previous lower limits on uh, the mass of a Higgs boson and a few ideas that we had about how one might extend this up to uh, a few GV. Uh, I can't resist also just uh, quoting this uh, final section from our paper. Uh, so... Apology and a caution. We apologise to experimentalists for having no idea what's the mass of the Higgs boson and not being sure of its coupling to other particles, except they're probably all very small. For this reason, we do not want to encourage big experimental searches. <laughs> <laughs> but we do feel that people performing experiments vulnerable to the Higgs boson should know how it may turn up. So I'm very glad that you didn't take our advice seriously. <laughs> okay. Uh, nevertheless, despite our best efforts, uh, the Higgs boson uh, started appearing on the uh, experimental uh, agenda. Uh, in particular, um, this was around the time when LEP was being proposed, and uh, we started working on the uh, proposal for the LEP accelerator in 1975-1976. Uh, Mary Gaillard and I wrote a uh, review of... Uh, theoretical ideas about experimental possibilities at, uh, at LEP and uh, one of the possibilities that we mentioned uh, relatively prominently was uh, the production of the Higgs boson. Uh, so, of course, at LEP, the principal processes which were uh, used to uh, constrain the mass of the Higgs boson were E plus E minus goes to Z plus Higgs associated production and uh, Z decay into Higgs plus mu plus mu minus. Interestingly, this process is often called the Bjorkane process. But in fact, he never talked about it. 
he did talk about this process in 1978, but in preparing this talk, I discovered to my shock and horror that actually Mary Gaillard and I had discussed it back in 1976, something which I've completely forgotten in the intervening 35 <laughs> Okay, so anyway, this is uh, what we wrote in our uh, theoretical review about d plus e minus goes to z plus Higgs, and uh, this is what we wrote about uh, uh, z into Higgs plus uh, mu plus mu minus. Okay, so that was uh, 1976. Uh, again, despite our best efforts, uh, that project was uh, approved, and it got to be under construction. And uh, in the uh, mid-1980s, together with Roberto Pache, uh, we edited uh, a review of uh, possibilities for LEP physics. And uh, there again, uh, the Higgs was given uh, quite a deal of prominence. Preparing this talk again, I'd forgotten that actually back in 1979, we'd done a review of all the various different ways in which the Higgs might show up at LEP. And uh, Grivas sitting there remembers. I, I was seeing you sitting here that reminded me, oh shit, I forgot about that paper, which you wrote in 1979. Okay, so uh, that was E plus E minus. Uh, a few words about uh, hadron collisions. So we've heard a lot today about processes for producing the Higgs in hadron-hadron uh, collisions. I hope that when you guys are successful in finding the Higgs boson, that you will remember to quote the original theoretical papers that uh, suggested how it might be produced in proton-antiproton <coughs> and proton-proton collisions. As far as I'm aware, the first pa paper to discuss the glue-glue process was this one here by George I. Glashow, Maciejek, and uh, Nanopoulos. And uh, this one here by Glashow, Nanopoulos, and Yildiz was the first one to discuss associated production of uh, W or Z plus Higgs. I'm not sure what was the first paper to discuss uh, vector boson fusion. Uh, perhaps somebody can tell me. I know what was the first paper to discuss vector boson fusion in E plus E minus. It was a paper written by Finjord back in 1976. But I'm not sure about proton-proton collisions. Okay, so uh, at this stage, uh, the Higgs boson was assuming a good deal of prominence. Of course, it was very prominent on the uh, SSC agenda, a uh, couple of slides from uh, the uh, <coughs> famous paper by Eichten et al. Uh, it was uh, also firmly on the LHC agenda. Uh, we had the first uh, workshop on LHC physics uh, back in uh, 1984, and uh, I had to give the talk about the, the new physics that you might look for. And it looks you know, depressingly familiar. You know, Higgs boson, supersymmetry. Uh, <laughs> so here we are, still looking for them. Um, by the way, I might uh, mention, put in a nice word for our chair. So it was uh, during this workshop that we had the idea that TT bar plus Higgs would be a good thing to calculate. And Zoltan went away and in about you know, 24 hours calculated it. <laughs> Okay, so that uh, takes you up to uh, the uh, very famous uh, Higgs uh, Hunter's Guide, which, uh, of course, has given its name to this meeting. Okay, now I'd like to uh, continue uh, post-Higgs Hunter's Guide. Uh, remember that I said, you know, back in 1976, we had absolutely no idea what the mass of the Higgs boson might be. I think the first uh, serious indications as to what the mass might be on the basis of experimental data uh, came in the early 1990s. And this, of course, came through the radiative corrections <coughs> and the fact that uh, LEP <coughs> observables were sensitive to the mass of the Higgs boson. Of course, only logarithmically sensitive, and so the sensitivity was much less than that of the top quark. Uh, but nevertheless, it, even before the top quark was discovered, we did make a couple of attempts to uh, estimate what the mass of the Higgs boson might be on the basis of radiative corrections measured at LEP. And uh, I remember being invited by the Aleph collaboration to give a talk and 
in the early 90s and I, I presented this sort of analysis and I could just tell the Aleph collaboration looking at me and thinking, this guy's gone nuts again. <laughs> anyway, uh, already at this early stage, you know, a lower Higgs boson mass was favoured rather than a higher one, although not with any degree of significance. Of course, things got a lot better when uh, the top quark mass was measured. Uh, this enabled you to reduce the uncertainties considerably. And uh, so uh, this is uh, what we were able to do in the mid-1990s. Of course, you know, things have come a long way in the uh, subsequent 15 years. Uh, this is uh, perhaps not totally uh, up to date, but uh, this gives you some flavour of uh, where the let measurements eventually finished up. And a uh, very well-known picture that shows you that uh, small values of the Higgs mass are favoured, at least by this particular observable, which is, as I said, coupling to leptons. Of course, there are many other LEP observables. You put them all together and the uh, hints in favour of a relatively light Higgs boson uh, become relatively strong. And here we have the very famous uh, blue band uh, plot uh, supplemented here by the uh, yellow exclusion from, uh, from LEP and uh, a previous version of the exclusion coming from the Tevatron. So uh, the uh, Z plus Higgs un Bjorkane process eventually gave you the lower limit of 114.4 GV. Uh, the radiative corrections seem to favour a mass, let's call it 90 plus or minus 30 GV. <coughs> Not sure whether you should believe the, the, se the second significant figures. Uh, the combined uh, upper limit, well, if you include the direct limit, you get 186 GV. If you just took the position electric fit by itself, was 157 GV. All this, of course, is, is pre-EPS. And uh, there was also this exclusion from uh, the Tevatron saying it had to be either below 158 or above 173 GV. So this is uh, the previous Tevatron uh, exclusion uh, between 158 and 173 GV. So the, the other piece of information uh, pre-EPS uh, were these uh, results from uh, CMS and ATLAS from the uh, 2010 data, which uh, in themselves didn't actually exclude any range of Higgs masses. But nevertheless, they actually made quite an interesting uh, contribution to the global fit. And uh, this is uh, taken from the paper that GFITTER put out a couple of weeks ago, which uh, summarizes all the information that we had before EPS. So you see the LEP exclusion over here, you see the Tevatron exclusion here, and uh, what you also see is the additional sort of, uh, contribution to chi-squared coming from those 2010 LHC results. So this is, uh, now I have a horrible doubt, is this absolutely the latest GFITTER result? Anyway, the latest GFITTER result looks very much like this. And uh, their conclusion pre-EPS was that uh, the Higgs mass was, well, the best fit value was 120 GV uh, with an asymmetric error, plus 12, minus 5 GV. The minus 5, of course, basically being provided by LEP. Mm. Although there was also a, a little nudge coming here from the Tevatron. And uh, plus 12 uh, basically coming from the uh, precision electroweak fit, also with a nudge from this exclusion around here. Okay, so uh, that takes us up to the uh, situation uh, pre-EPS. Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, we're playing a, a high-stakes game here, okay? Uh, it's not just the last two lines of the T-shirt, right? It's uh, how is particle symmetry broken? Is there an elementary scalar field in nature? What's the fate of the standard model when you extrapolate to <coughs> higher energies? Uh, did mass appear when the universe was a picosecond old? Perhaps the Higgs helped create the matter in the universe. Uh, perhaps the Higgs, or something very much like it, is responsible for inflation and what made the universe so big and old. 
Uh, why is there so little dark energy? Everybody knows about dark energy. People probably also know that the Higgs naively gives you something like you know, 60 or 120 orders of magnitude too much dark energy. So you know, there's a lot of stake in this uh, Higgs boson search. So perhaps it's not entirely unreasonable that probably uh, the Higgs boson is the most uh, recognized, undiscovered particle, at least as far as the general public is concerned. So I'd like to say a little bit more about uh, the possible fate of the standard model. So on the left-hand side of this, here we have the, uh, the Higgs mass axis. And along the horizontal axis, we have the scale up to which the standard model might remain valid. So it's well known that there are two potential disasters. So one potential disaster is you've got a large Higgs mass, you've got a large Higgs self-coupling, and if you run up to high energies using the normalization group, uh, potentially that coupling will blow up and some sort of new physics will have to come in. And uh, we heard about one of the possible ideas for what might happen there earlier on this afternoon uh, from Vic Gupta, the uh, classical on uh, suggestion. Now, there's another disaster which could come in if the Higgs mass is small, corresponding to a small Higgs self-coupling. In that case, when you calculate the renormalization, the dominant effect is through the top quark, and the top quark drives the Higgs coupling negative. It actually makes the vacuum unstable. And uh, so that's what's going on down here. There's a question of whether our current electroweak vacuum is absolutely unstable or whether it's metastable with a long lifetime uh, and so on. So depending on the scale up to which you think that the standard model might, might remain valid, you have a finite range over which the Higgs can lie. So for example, if you think that the standard model works all the way up to the Planck scale, way over here somewhere, then the Higgs has to lie somewhere between about 130 and 170 or something like that GeV. Conversely, if you discovered a Higgs weighing between 130 and whatever this is, let's say 170 GeV, if you found a Higgs weighing between 130 and 170 GeV, then there would be no reason from this analysis to expect new physics before the Planck mass. So there's a lot of discussion about what would be the most depressing outcome from the LHC. I actually think the most depressing outcome would be to discover a Higgs boson, let's say, around 140 GeV. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but we'll come back to that in a moment. OK, so this is uh, take from a paper we wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, this shows you, uh, on the basis of the knowledge then, which hasn't changed a tremendous amount since, uh, what were the most likely ranges of the Higgs mass and the scale at which the new physics sh should appear, either at a low scale in order to prevent the vacuum from collapsing or at a high scale in order to prevent the self-coupling from blowing up, which you might describe as a, the Higgs, Scylla and Charybdis. Actually, already then we concluded that uh, a blow-up was uh, excluded with a, a very high confidence level just because of this general indication that the Higgs mass is probably relatively small. Uh, and that's what's uh, shown here. This is actually uh, 1 minus CL, and you see the peak is uh, over here at around 120 GeV, where we heard that before. Uh, and uh, the maximum in the blow-up region was you know, at a much lower confidence level. So... When you guys discover the Higgs boson, then you will be able to tell us what is the fate of the standard model. So if, for example, you happen to discover a Higgs weighing 120 GeV, then for sure we would know that you could not extrapolate the standard model up to the Planck scale, and some new physics would have to come in at some scale, let's say 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 GeV. If you guys would discover a Higgs boson at 115 GeV, then you could say that that new physics would have to come in even earlier in order to avoid the standard model potential collapsing. Okay, so supposing 
we're in this relatively low mass range. So how could you avoid having the Higgs potential collapse? Well, I remind you that this <coughs> negative renormalization is driven by the top quark, a fermion. So we counteract the fermion by postulating a new boson, and that can indeed avert the collapse of the potential. However, it has to be incredibly fine-tuned in order to avoid a blow-up. So here you see that by changing some parameter of this anti-blow-up potential from 70.9 to 71.0, we go from collapse to explosion. So this is not a terribly stable uh, mechanism for stabilizing the vacuum. Of course, if you put in new fermions, then you could get rid of this blow-up problem. But at this stage, you've got something which looks pretty much like supersymmetry. So I'm not saying that you know, if the Higgs is measured to have a mass of 120 G, GeV, you must have supersymmetry. But I certainly would regard it as being circumstantial hint that something like supersymmetry might be right. Unfortunately, of course, uh, supersymmetry hasn't shown up yet. And uh, this is taken from uh, a recent analysis by the Master Code Collaboration, of which I'm proud to be a member, where we put together all the various different experimental constraints that tell us we have not yet seen supersymmetry, together with G minus 2 that tells us, well, maybe we've seen something, although, of course, we don't know whether it's supersymmetry or not. And uh, so this is currently our... 68% confidence level region. This is our 95% confidence level region. Uh, for compar so this is on the basis of the 2011 data. So all the data that was shown at EPS is included in this fit. And for comparison, this dotted line is what we were saying pre-EPS. So indeed, no, we get a little bit more twitchy because supersymmetry was not reported at EPS. But still, you know, it's um, not yet catastrophic. Uh, the overall confidence level for a CMSSM fit is something like 11%. What about the Higgs in supersymmetry? So, as I've said, 120 GeV I would find to be circumstantial hint in favour of supersymmetry. Uh, specifically, for example, in the CMSSM, you would predict a Higgs weighing somewhere between 115 and 120 GeV. Okay, so that was... Uh, Pre-EPS. How about post-EPS? So this is the, uh, the latest version of the uh, Tevatron exclusion, which uh, now, in addition to expanding this exclusion at intermediate masses, also excludes a significant region almost approaching the uh, LEP lower limit. And it is beginning to disfavor a mass around 115 GeV. So this is uh, one of the... LHC exclusions. This is the other LHC exclusion. And uh, we see that uh, broad swathes of Higgs mass space are now being excluded. And we expect this exclusion region to expand rapidly in the coming days. Well, weeks. Uh, as we've uh, heard, there are some excesses. So there's the uh, much discussed excess around 140 GeV, uh, but also if you look over here, you know, maybe there's a little bit too many over around 120 GeV as well. Uh, only time will tell. Now, it would be great if we had an official uh, <laughs> combination of the uh, CMS and ATLAS results, but we don't. Uh, what we do is we have some unofficial bloggers combination, <laughs> which has been described publicly by Bill Murray at Grenoble as being nonsense. Nevertheless, in the absence of anything better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so here you see that in fact, uh, combined Atlas and CMS seem to exclude our, you know, this whole range here, going from around 140 GV up to... Uh, 500 GV, and uh, well, there's a little bit of an excess over there, and as you see, a little bit. Of, mm. <laughs> so one of the questions that, that I have in my mind is whether this much 
discussed excess at 130, 140 GeV is large enough to be likely to be a standard model Higgs boson. You see, much of this excess is actually below the, the one line. So personally, I'm keeping my uh, eye more on that. <laughs> no insignificant glitch. So uh, I would welcome a bit more discussion about you know, what sort of plots it would mo be most useful to see provided by uh, ATLAS and CMS. And I've been going on about this uh, during the course of the day. Uh, I'm going to go on about it again for another minute or so. So I would certainly like to see more plots like this one, which show you what a Higgs signal would look like. So I, I ask Atlas and CMS in future, whenever they uh, publish results of some search, that they include you know, one or two little uh, objects to guide the eye as to what a Higgs signal would have looked like in that, uh, in that search. So this is a, a plot from, uh, from Atlas, which I, I find very interesting, and I thank uh, Barumi and uh, Louis for discussions about this over lunch. This is, so the solid line here shows you the, the P0 for the background only hypothesis, and the dotted line is the P0 that you would expect if there was also a signal. And again, what is, interest, what is interesting here is that, at least in the Atlas data by themselves, what you would expect for P0 in the presence of a signal seems to be pretty consistent with what is actually uh, measured. And uh, the same point is made here. Uh, this tells you that the CLS for the signal, and you see that it stays you know, pretty high all the way until you get around 150 GeV or so, where it sort of falls off a cliff. But again, I, I would like to see on this sort of plot what a Higgs signal would be. Supposing the Higgs weighed 140 GeV, what would it look like on this plot? Now, another thing which I would like to see more of <coughs> is uh, this plot here, which uh, if you look very carefully in the CMS paper somewhere around page you know, 257, you find this thing here, which tells you the best fit plus the one sigma bands for the cross-section divided by the standard model cross-section. And uh, what you see is that uh, over here, if anything, they're seeing too many Higgses. Uh, down here in this region where actually the excess is, uh, is actually the central value is a little bit below the standard model prediction. But probably, mm. not, probably not significantly below. Um, so I had an argument with the Atlas guys. They said, well, of course, we have this sort of plot, but we decided that it would feed too much theoretical speculation if we actually published it. Bullshit! <laughs> the less information you provide, the more theorists are going to speculate. <laughs> no, you're, as, you're, you're as bad as the Chinese government. Put the information out there. Okay, so, so I, I've talked about the, uh, the Higgs boson. So, so, so what if the Higgs is not a Higgs? So what do I mean by this? Well, of course, everyone knows that the tree-level Higgs couplings are proportional to mass with a coefficient which is given by the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And uh, as we discussed in detail back in 1975, 1976, the couplings of the Higgs are very similar to those of the diloton of scale invariance. Of course, this is broken by uh, the mu squared term and the effective potential, and also by anomalies. Now, in fact, you can generalize this diloton idea to consider a, a wider class of theories where you have some pseudo diloton of some new, nearly conformal, strongly interacting sector. And there's been a lot of discussion of this uh, in the literature over the last uh, few years. And typically what happens in these models is that the coupling is again proportional to mass, with a, a V here, which is potentially bigger than the normal electroweak scale V. Uh, and this is actually why I think it would be interesting to show this sort of plot, because then people who have such theories can immediately see you know, what is excluded for what particular value of this uh, capital V quantity. Uh, 
Now, one interesting feature of this theory is that uh, you could get enhanced couplings to uh, gluons. Uh, and in fact, the, a theory with a, a fourth generation is, a, is an example of this sort of phenomenon. The coupling to gluons is enhanced by those extra heavy quarks that could be exchanged around the loops. Uh, and that's why there's such a big exclusion of four generation models. Uh, amusingly, the coupling to gamma gamma, which is also sensitive to loops, is actually suppressed if you put in more particles uh, because the uh, W comes in with the opposite sign to quarks and the W has a, a bigger absolute value than the single top quark. And if you put in more quarks, then you get a cancellation between the W loop and, uh, and the quark loop. Anyway, th this pseudo dilaton model has a very well defined set of deviations from the standard Higgs theory. And so I think this would be a very useful sort of straw person against which to uh, beat the data. Okay, so I showed you one nonsensical plot. Uh, and I'd like to finish by showing you an even more nonsensical plot by the same blogger who. Uh, undiscouraged by Bill Murray, went on to combine the Teratron limit <laughs> with the LHC. Now, this is the plot that I argue proves that there must be new physics beyond the Higgs boson. Because, according to this plot, either you can have a standard model coupling and the mass is very large, in which case the Higgs coupling blows up and there must be new physics to, to tame that <coughs> blowing up. Or you're somewhere in this intermediate mass range where the Higgs coupling is actually less than in the standard model, and so you're into one of these technidiloton scenarios with some new strongly interacting sector. Or you're over here on the left-hand side where, again, you, it's compatible with the standard model Higgs couplings, but this is in the low mass region where the Higgs potential collapses and you need new physics to stop it from collapsing. So I would argue, well, of course, this is garbage, okay? If Bill Murray were here, he would be apoplectic, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think potentially we're in a situation where quite soon we could conclude that there must be new physics. Of course, this doesn't mean to say this new physics is accessible to the LHC, but new physics. So, in uh, 1982, uh, Mrs. Thatcher came to visit CERN, and uh, she was introduced to uh, a bunch of uh, British physicists, including a theoretical physicist whom you see on the left. <laughs> what do you do, young man? <laughs> so I say, well, I uh, think of things for the experimentalists to look for, and then I uh, hope they find something different. <laughs> so Mrs. Thatcher wasn't really cool with that. Because <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she really liked things to be the way that she liked them to be. Okay. Wouldn't it be better, young man, if they found what you predicted? So I said, well, if they found exactly what we predicted, then we wouldn't feel that we were learning anything. Eventually, we reached a historic compromise. It was agreed that the best thing would be if you found something like what you predict, but not exactly. <laughs> and that's what I hope for the Higgs boson. Thank you. is very interesting overview and ideas. So, so thanks very much. John is very interesting historical overview and ideas. So comments, questions. Abdul so Hak is uh, Abdul Hak over there. Just to one answer to one question you raised about the WW fusion mechanism. In fact, I think it has been pointed out by uh, Bob Kahn and Sully Dawson in 84 for the PP collisions, but somewhat earlier for E plus E minus collision. In fact, it's the same for by Petkov, I think, and... Uh, Fignard. Yeah, and, and also Fignard. 
it was uh, uh, yeah, Jones and Petkov and then Fignor, yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I actually suggested to them to do it because, <laughs> because uh, I was aware that the alm bjorkane process gave you this kinematic limit of the square root of S minus MZ. So I thought it'd be interesting to try to probe beyond that by doing this intermediate effective boson fusion. There was one over there, two over there. In my college days, I would go to the library to consult Western books, and then I would buy the Russian books because they were very cheap. And I learned that every theorem had a Russian name in addition. Uh, what about in the history of the Higgs? <laughs> and especially the Higgs to two photons, I have some concern. Who calculated first that? Um, OK. So, uh, as far as I'm aware, we were the first people to calculate the Higgs into two photon with uh, Mary Gaia and Dimitri Nanopoulos. Of course, two gamma decays of uh, scalar and pseudoscalar bosons had been calculated previously. Uh, first by uh, Jack Steinberger in, when was it, 1949, right? And then it was realized this was an anomaly. And uh, then I think the first person to calculate a scalar boson decaying into gamma gamma was uh, Schwinger in 1951. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, in the specific context of the Higgs boson, nobody had been crazy enough before us. First, uh, I want to thank you. That was an amazing talk, and uh, I've always wanted to hear the historical perspective. The thing that I've always been confused about is, given that three different groups within a matter of months independently or more or less independently came up with a, a scalar field, and perhaps the, the boson itself or the particle, was, was this whole thing much of a theoretical leap by these people, or was it, would it, have, is it pretty much once you get the field theory, it was automatic? It's, it's interesting. I think you know, there's, there's other examples where groups working in parallel come up with similar ideas, and it must be something in the water. Um, I think the idea, you know, it, it was floating around there waiting to be discovered. Uh, Anderson had written his paper yeah. about the condensed matter thing. People were wondering how you could generalize it to, uh, to relativistic theory. Uh, Gilbert had you know, given it prominence by saying it wasn't possible. Uh, so the gauntlet had been thrown down. Um, I, I, I must admit, I haven't talked enough to Anglais and, uh, and Guralnik to figure out you know, what exactly brought their groups into it. I think I know pretty well what brought Higgs into it. Okay. Well, uh, Jonas Anders and Braut was working on solid state physics and, and Anderson just before, right? So therefore he was motivated by Anderson. Right. 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 I right. talked right. to him. That's yeah. But Higgs, why Higgs was working on it, it was not clear. Sorry? Why Higgs was working at the same time because he was not related to solid state physics before, right? Well, yeah, actually, he started off life in, uh, in atomic physics. He Atom. didn't, didn't, didn't start off life as a particle physicist. Yeah. So then. So Richard had yeah, a question of <coughs> But by the way, if, if people are interested, um, I, I have, I mean, many of the principals have written articles about you know, their perspective on it. Goralnik, for example, has written a, a couple of papers. Uh, Peter Higgs has also written a couple of papers. And uh, a few months ago, uh, we had a, a video talk by Peter Higgs at a workshop I organized in uh, King's College, London. And I had a transcript made of that talk. And if anybody is interested, just let me know, and I'll send them a copy of that. It is, in principle, available on the uh, CERN document server, but it's impossible to find anything. <laughs> there is another scalar field which was discovered a few years before Higgs, Kibble, and others, Skern. And it can't be <laughs> men of yours. And it happened that Skern came to New York at the same time as Higgs and Kibble. And nobody understood what Skern was doing, because he was a very abstract thinker. Now, there is a strong analogy between the Skirm field and the Higgs field, 
other scalar fields. And uh, one could even speculate that the existence of fermions is due to this analogy. Because as you know, the skirm has explained qualitatively nucleons and how they interact. And the uh, Higgs field is relevant for fermions in general, for the standard model. And there exists a strong analogy which may be of interest. Yeah. Well, well, of course, uh, in uh, QCD, the skirmion is a, is a fermion, right? And uh, you know, within the context of the strong interactions, people always had the idea that the skirmion could be a useful representation of, of baryons. And personally, I, I do think it's an interesting representation of baryons. Uh, so, so specifically, what the skirmion enables you to do is to, to generate a classical solution of the non-renormalizable, non-linear, effective Lagrangian of pions, a classical solution which is a fermion that carries a quantum number which you can identify with baryon number. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what was, what was happening in England back in those days, you know, all these people coming up with all these uh, fantastic ideas. You know, things, haven't been, things have not been the same in British theoretical physics ever since then. Yes. So, any more questions or comments? So, John, thanks again very much for this fantastic talk.